tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the General Dynamics F-111. The first production aircraft to employ a variable swing wing, the F-111 specialty is penetrating heavily defended airspace. Known for its durability and versatility, the F-111 is one of the most effective weapons in the U.S. inventory. A long-range all-weather fighter bomber, the F-111 proved its worth in the 1986 Libyan air raid and more recently in the Persian Gulf. Tonight, soar high in the F-111 on wing. This is the F-111, a fighter bomber that has seen action in Vietnam and in the Persian Gulf. Though the design is more than 30 years old, in some ways the plane is only now revealing its tremendous capabilities. A wide range of technological innovations have made the F-111 faster and deadlier than ever before. It has few rivals in its class. In 1958, the Tactical Air Command, or TAC, the Air Force Division responsible for ground attack and interdiction, flew F-105 Thunder Chiefs. The Thunder Chief was notorious for its mechanical problems and lack of maneuverability. The F-105 was built expressly for long-range strike missions. It could carry nuclear bombs at high speeds to distant targets. The plane was not built for conventional air war, but in Vietnam, the F-105 was the best plane TAC had on hand for air combat, and the war highlighted the plane's flaws. The mission requirements of Vietnam, plus the fuel-guzzling F-105's limited range, necessitated flying at low levels. This made the plane vulnerable to guided missiles. The Thunder Chief was restricted to daytime bombing and often needed fighter escort. It also required long, conventional runways. TAC knew from the start that new technology would quickly make the F-105 obsolete. Even as the 105 entered service, TAC was working on its replacement, the TFX project. The TFX fighter bomber would incorporate new materials, microcircuit technology, and innovative engineering concepts, including solid-state electronics that would give the plane fantastic avionics capabilities. Turbofan engines utilizing afterburners for extra power. And most exciting of all, 
a variable swing wing that would greatly enhance the heavy plane's maneuverability. At the same time, the U.S. Navy was developing its own brand new high-tech aircraft for the fleet defense mission to succeed the F-4 Phantom. Although the F-4 was eventually used by both services, historically, the Navy and the Air Force developed their aircraft separately. Each service had very different needs. But in 1961, newly appointed Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara announced it was time for a change. McNamara, a former vice president of the Ford Motor Company, arrived at the Pentagon determined to dispose of bureaucratic duplication and waste. The huge price tags of separately developed aircraft seemed a good place to start cutting. McNamara insisted on a policy of standardization. He told the service chiefs that he wanted one basic aircraft design, suitable for use by both the Air Force and the Navy. In January of 1962, after several competitions, the Pentagon reduced the field to two possible alternatives. Boeing's 818 model, while favored by both services, did not have enough shared design elements. The other design was a joint venture from General Dynamics and the Grumman Corporation. This design offered a very high level of common parts for both services. The only major components to differ were the landing gear, the wing length, and the nose. These are mock-ups of the two different nose designs. The Navy B design, and the Air Force A model. McNamara was impressed. In November of 1962, an order was placed for 18 Air Force and five Navy planes. The aircraft was now designated the F-111. The planes were built at the Fort Worth plant of General Dynamics Convair Division. The first pre-production model was officially rolled out 16 days ahead of schedule. Twenty-five months after the contract was signed, the first F-111, an Air Force A model, took to the air. The twin-seat F-111's unique features included a crew capsule that could be jettisoned as a complete unit clear of the main fuselage by the use of rockets. Ejection could be accomplished at any speed, at any altitude, or even below water. After it had landed or surfaced, the capsule could act as a survival shelter. The F-111 was also the first aircraft to go into full production utilizing after-burning turbofan engines. The TF-30 engine was economical and gave the plane great range. The afterburners were available for quick takeoff and extra speed. Still more range was built into the General Dynamics design by utilizing every possible area available for fuel storage. Even without external wing tanks, the plane had a range of over 2,500 nautical miles. With in-flight refueling or external fuel tanks, the F-111 could go anywhere, anytime. When no external fuel was carried, all of the wing points were free to lift an enormous array of weaponry. And of course, the plane could carry ordnance in its internal bomb bay.
F-111s can carry almost any weapon in the Air Force arsenal, from the M-61 Vulcan cannon to a free-falling nuclear bomb. F-111 can drop foil as an electronic countermeasure, and flares can be discharged to confuse heat-seeking missiles. One of the original requirements of the TFX project was that the design should allow for landing on short makeshift runways. General Dynamics met the challenge by inventing high flotation variable terrain landing gear. Another important F-111 feature that was brand new was terrain following radar. This system allows pilots to select an operating height above ground of as little as 200 feet. When the control is set, the aircraft can fly at over 600 miles an hour by its forward terrain scanning radar, adjusting its height automatically. A manual mode allows pilots to use the radar gathered information reproduced on a cockpit instrument display. Thus, it is possible for the F-111 to fly at night in all weather and still remain low enough to avoid radar detection. The reason why I love flying the F-111 is because of the uh, ground attack mode that it does. Uh, it flies low level at high speeds, uh, any weather, day or night. Uh, it has the capability in the systems to do that anywhere from 200 feet to 1,000 feet. I do not necessarily have to be flying the jet at that time because of the automatic systems. Uh, I'm enclosed in a capsule that uh, protects me from the environment uh, in case we have to uh, leave the aircraft or eject, and that's a, an advantage that I like. The F-111 requires uh, more systems knowledge than most because the mission is longer so that if something does go wrong, it takes more time to recover the airplane because you're at a greater distance. And it takes someone who is, that stays on top of it, as you can imagine, operating two, three, four hundred feet above the ground in a snowstorm at night going through the mountains. Uh, you have to be ready for just about any eventuality. The F-111 was the first production aircraft in aviation history to employ variable swing wings. But the story of the swing wing really goes back to the Second World War. Messerschmitt produced several swing wing designs and actually built the P-1101, but it never flew. Much of this design was used in the American Bell X-5, built after the war. This model flew successfully. As did the Grumman Jaguar although neither plane was developed. For high-speed flight, the F-111's wing could be swept back to form a delta configuration. An intermediate position was often used for economical mid-range flight. A full forward position was available for takeoff, landing, and low-speed flying. The plane